Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. Today we're going to talk a little bit about two methods of play that kind of combine together that create what is an RPG in my mind, the procedural and the narrative. And also, Happy New Year. This is my first video in 2023. Thanks everybody who's been supporting me throughout the past few years and my whole life, I guess. But <laughs> anyways, let's talk about this a little bit. So I'm going to call them methods. I know there's all these breakdowns that people make for players. There's the role player and there's this, but very few times we talk about running the game in different types of DMs. So in my mind, there's two pillars. I'll use that since we use that a lot in uh, RPGs to the game. There is the procedural area and then there is the narrative. And where we fall as GMs and how we run the game will just depend on the type of game we run, right? We can run games all different ways. And I am a firm believer that while system does matter for certain genres and stuff, I think how you run the game depends on your table more so than the actual mechanics. So I'll talk a little bit about system, but for the most part, this is going to be general advice as usual. So Let's define them and I'll kind of point you in the right direction. So when you think procedural, on the far end of procedural, think board games. When you're playing a board game, you go through a step. There's a process of play, an order of operations. You draw a card, you roll a die, you move your piece, you do another card, you make a trade. It goes around the table, generally turn-based like RPGs. And when the, the full turn is over, we start at the beginning, we do it again. It can be really fun. There can be a little interaction. There's all kinds of stuff going on, but there's a procedure. There's a process that we follow. When we think narrative, that on the far end would fall into something like we're just gathered around telling a story uh, around a campfire. I start the story and then somebody picks up and says, oh, yes, I also heard this one. And did you know also that, you know, in the hills over there, they're said to be a monster Oh, really? Because where I grew up in this story forms and we can build a full on story, right? That could be as far as even story games, which I am no expert in. So I'm not going to talk that far, but could they go further in that direction, right? War games or maybe fall further into the procedural. But in RPGs, we have both of these. They are used for the creation of the adventures and running them. So I'm going to run through the basics here and I would love to know what you think. Where do you fall on this kind of spectrum of mixing the two together because I feel like most of us, if we're running a D and D type game or an RPG, we're using all of this. So let's talk procedural first. So the procedures in especially OSR games are often put out as one of the great features of them. It makes them easy to run in a lot of ways because everything's right in front of you. This doesn't mean that you not, you're not talking in character and that you're not having fun, but what it does mean is that you understand that this is the process. Step, 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 step. Move on to the next one. It's nice when you're learning, especially. And I'm not saying this is something that you move away from once you have learned it, right? It, what I'm saying is that it's a good way to jump into it. Because if I just say, sit down with your friends, D&D is about telling stories, make up a story, that can be confusing. And where do we begin, right? So the procedure gives us a place to start. We could go even so far as to roll on a table for a random quest. I have a great quest generator that uh, somebody made. I don't know the name off the top of my head, but I'll put it in the link below. It was made for Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerer's Hyperborea. It creates sword and sorcery quests. And basically you roll like, who's the bad guy? What's the twist? You can literally procedurally create an adventure hook. Next, map generation. Again, we can find a map, we can draw a map, but we can also use things like the old strategic review or the Dungeon Master's Guide in probably every edition, but definitely in first and fifth, which are the two I have to generate maps and dungeons randomly. We can follow a procedure. You roll to see how big the room is. You roll to see if there's a secret door. You roll, we can do this, right? We can just sit down and do it. And of course, the thing that we probably do the most, or me, is I use a procedural process when I stock my dungeons. I roll for each room. Is there a monster here? Is there treasure? Is there a trap? What might it be? There's lots of resources for this. I'll throw some in the descriptions below. Don John is one that I use a lot. You can use, obviously, the Dungeon Master's Guides from any of the editions. If you're running 5th edition, there's Kobold Fight Club, which is great for kind of balancing your monsters if you're concerned about that. And another favorite of mine is the Tome of Adventure Design. So again, I'll put links to all these things below. Let's talk narrative for a second. So I'm going to use, and we, I've had some pushback on this and some discussions and back and forth on my podcast about the word plot, but I'm going to use plot here. And if you listen to my plot episode, you'll understand what I mean, but I'll explain it a little bit here. In a narrative situation, you're creating 
a larger situation, not a situation like you might do somewhere else where the situation is there's a there's a crevasse for them to cross. The narrative situation might be there is a town that is plagued by ghosts, right? This is now something going on. Why is the town plagued by ghosts? What can prevent the ghosts from coming back? Do you need to help the ghosts in some ways? Are they being brought by a necromancer? You're creating this like story that's going on in the world that you're going to insert the player characters into. The important part here, and again, this is where it can be dangerous, is we don't want to railroad them. We don't want to say, this is what's going to happen. You're going to show up here. You're going to do this step, that step, step, step. What we're going to do instead is we're going to say, here's what's going on. If the player characters do nothing, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen da, 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 all the ways until the end. As soon as they are inserted into the situation, everything changes. And that is right. That's the RPG. So I create the situation. This town is plagued by ghosts. More and more, the ghosts have been rising. Maybe it used to be once a year somebody would see one. Now people are seeing them every full moon. What's going on? Turns out maybe somebody uh, from town has been looting the graveyard for some reason. Maybe somebody's doing experiments. Maybe somebody has come back, uh, you know, that was gone for a long time and is looking for something that was buried there. Maybe adventurers came and, dis and disturbed it. Whatever the, the thing is, you're going to create that. And this is narrative situations are pretty much almost always the basis when you're creating a mystery. It's not super easy to create from scratch a mystery procedurally because you've got to kind of know stuff, right? You need a little bit more kind of handhold control. And this is again why you really use a mix, right? You're running a procedural game, you're creating your adventure, but you're also going to throw in these little narrative things. You roll randomly that there's an altar in this room and then you think to yourself, well, that's really interesting. What could that be? And you create a little story around it. So this is why I say we combine these things. But for now, I'm just kind of breaking them up to make them easier to, to digest, if you will. So insofar as like what you're going to create for the narrative besides the plot, here's where you're probably going to be a lot more NPC heavy. I'm not going to say that you wouldn't be procedurally, but I'm saying that if you're running something that's a more narrative, you're going to want personalities. So you're going to want to drop in NPCs. Those are probably much more important to you than the exact number of gold pieces or orcs that are in a lair who the people are, their connections to the story, and how the player characters can help or be thwarted by them based on their actions and the desires of them. Here, I think that you need to be a little bit more open to what I'm going to call a logic and feel. You're going to decide that the man who owns the jewelry store that's been stealing the jewelry from the dead, right, has a bunch of jewels because that makes sense. You're not going to roll randomly and find out they have three copper pieces. That doesn't make sense. But you could roll and see they only have three copper pieces and then think, why have they been stealing all these jewels, but they don't have them? And then roll the story forward a different way. So I'm not saying you can't randomize it. I'm just saying you want to maybe think a little bit tighter, at least when you're first forming it, as to what's going on. So I'm going to get into running in a second, but I just want to start by saying that I usually do kind of an inside out operation when I start a campaign. I start almost always procedurally. I don't know what my players are going to want to be involved in right away. They, you know, generally change and they're always looking for different things depending on the characters they make. So usually the first handful of adventures in a campaign that I make are just procedural dungeons or hex crawls or city crawls that they can interact with the world. And as they start to lean in directions and I realize, oh, this group really loves mysteries or this group really loves to search for treasure or this group wants to save the world, then I can start creating these little narrative points in the world that they can interact with. They're still going to have to find them. I'm not just going to put it on their lap, but I'm going to put things out there that I think that they'll, you know, the feelers basically. So you start procedurally and then you expand. I think this is easier, even though you might think when you're sitting down, if you've never run an adventure before and you're about to start a campaign, you're thinking, I'm just going to come up with a big meta plot and a big bad because that's easy. I can think, well, Darth Vader, or blah, 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 the emperor. This is this is probably not, in my opinion, the right way to go. Start simple. What if your players don't care about that big, huge thing that you created? And now you're going to be forced to railroad them or abandon it. Start off with the most kind of basic thing that they can interact with so you can get a feel for what they like. OK, let's talk running the game. So in my mind, the classic procedural that most people understand on some level is the hex crawl. 
So if you don't know what a hex crawl is, I'm going to describe it and you'll see what I mean. In a hex crawl, you've got a large map. The party is starting somewhere, usually some kind of point of light, a town or something, and they're exploring. Doing a hex crawl is a little bit different or generally is different than traveling cross country. That's a whole other thing. And I've talked a little bit about travel in the past, but a hex crawl means that you're exploring. You're looking for things. Maybe you have a rumor. Maybe you know that there's a ruined keep in the to the south, but you're not exactly sure what's there. So at the beginning of each turn of a hex crawl, the party decides, we're going to head south today. Let's say in this case. Okay, well, to the south, there are forests you're going to go through. We're going to now roll to see if you get lost. It's usually one of the processes, right? You might also roll to see if you pick up food along the way or if you encounter any kind of... Uh, you know, forest creatures that could be negative or positive, you know, whatever. Then you might roll as you might go as far as if using something like Dolmenwood, you might roll something like, do you find a good campsite? And basically this is a process. Again, almost, you can see how it sounds almost board gamey. You're rolling through the process. This is what's going on. Now, some people don't embrace this and don't like this. And they just throw a handful of dice down and say, this is what happened. And they move on. If you're that person, you might just not want to do the hex crawl at all, right? You could just have them travel. You don't, you're not forced to hex crawl. Even though the game says, you know, many games, OSR games tell you that's how you travel. You don't have to do that. If it's not fun for your group, then don't hex crawl. But if you're going to hex crawl, I recommend that you fully embrace it. I've gone back to doing what they tell you to do in original Dungeons and Dragons, which is I literally use Outdoor Survival, which is a board game with hexes on it. I put the board in front of the characters they move a little piece around the board, they roll, it becomes a different experience. The hex crawl is something different. Now, they're traveling across the hexes and they can travel multiple days really quickly with quick turns, which is rolling and talking about what's going on, brief narration. Then they encounter a cave. Now you zoom back in, right? Or they encounter an NPC or, you know, very recently my group just encountered a whole pack of centaurs in the woods. Now you zoom in, now you're a narrative. What's going on with centaurs? What's the story here? How can they involve themselves? This, again, this is the blending. But just the moving over land is the procedural. What direction? Are we lost? Do we find food? Do we find shelter? Do we encounter a monster? Wash and repeat. Now, this can also be the dungeon crawl, right? You're doing, I know the Dungeon 23 thing's going on. I'm doing it as well. The mega dungeons often fall somewhat in these categories, especially on low levels, you know, you move through the corridor, you're looking for traps, you listen at the door, you pick the lock, you bust the door open, you know, you, you fight the troll, whatever. These are all procedurals. And actually, combat, in no matter what system you're running, no matter, obviously there's a million systems, but in most systems you're running, even if you're running mostly narrative, when you get to combat, that part generally is procedural, right? It's generally turn-based and everybody has a process and that's how you do it. So, if you've been running fully kind of in, in your head story game mode, but you still do combat in the way most D&D-esque RPGs do it, then you're still doing some procedural. Another thing I want to point out is that in a procedural game, most of the procedures are mechanical on some level. That's not to say, and I know all the old school people are jumping up, no, you look for traps by describing it. You do, but generally there's a role involved or there's a mechanic to have a role. The characters can adjust this role or even avoid it with what they do, that falls into the narrative. This is one reason why procedural games or games with lots of procedures are great for solo play, because so much of it is just there, right? You say, all right, my group is going to go down the corridor. They're going to search for a trap. You can, you know, you can play it out with yourself, I guess. And some people do that and they journal and stuff, but you can also just say, well, a dwarf has a two and six chance of finding any kind of traps in the hallway. Let me roll to see if they find it. If they do or they don't, you move on. There's a door. Is it locked? Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I listen at the door. I roll for it. Procedural games are great for solo play. And that's one reason why I'm using original Dungeons & Dragons for my solo play on my other channel. Okay, let's jump to narrative. This falls a little bit more into what I've been talking about in running the game in the past, which is you create a situation. So let's again, let's talk about this dungeon corridor. There is a 50 foot, let's say 100 foot long corridor in this dungeon. And... The party has 40 feet of light. They're like shining out in front of them. You look down the, the corridor, you see it stretches out in front of you in the dark. I'm going to take some marbles out of my pocket and I'm going to roll them down the corridor to see if the corridor is flat or if it's slanting. Or I'm going to tap the floor as I go to see if I hear any hollow sounds. Or I'm going to cast light on the head of my arrow and just shoot it down the whole corridor. 
Let's say they do that one. They cast light on the head of their arrow. They shoot it down the corridor. It sticks into a door 100 feet down at the end. There's a door. The light, of course, you know, they, they have their lantern plus the light spell coming back. They can see most of the corridor. They see it's empty. There's no monster. They move cautiously towards the door. Now, of course, they've made no choice because they shot an arrow into the door. But hey, you know what? They made that choice. OK, well, the elf was really good at listening at the doors. They're going to listen or they have a high investigation or perception, depending on what you know game you're playing. OK, we're going to listen. Oh, you know what? I'm going to actually before I listen to the door, I'm going to lay down on my belly and I'm going to try to look under the door. And, you know, I'll shield myself from the light. We'll pull it back. Do I see any light coming from under the door? Again, I'm now narrating. I'm talking about the situation. I'm changing it. So now let's say there are there is something on the other side. So there's something on the other side that uses light. Let's say a group of bandits. Now, did they hear the arrow? You could roll for it. If, you, if you're unsure, you could use logic. Well, yeah, of course they're going to hear an arrow shooting into the thing. But hold on. Are the bandits drunk and are they gambling because this is their normal place they're hanging out or are they extra cautious because they're also looting the place this is all part of the situation and again this is why we're going to use logic to figure out what might be the best way to handle this let's say the bandits heard the noise they extinguish their lights or maybe they don't right they're human they can't see in the dark so they leave their light on so dunk, arrow hits the door party goes up they listen they hear nothing because the bandits are being quiet right party member gets on the belly looks under the door Yes, actually, you do see light under there. Hmm. Now you've got options, right? What are they going to do? Are they going to try to open the door quickly? Are they going to try to be stealthy? Are they just going to turn around and walk away? Are they going to use ESP? All of these things now are going to be part of the situation that the party is trying to solve. There's no just roles to see what happens. You're going to have to decide based on what happened. This is why I say often the narrative follows the procedural. We're running a procedural dungeon crawl we're moving through the corridors. We're doing the things that we do. And that stuff can be just handled very quickly, right? When we get to that moment, the important moment, if you will, that's when we drop back to narrative. Now, people that just love narrative might just say, okay, well, you walk through hundreds of cor hundreds of feet of empty corridor in the dungeon and you come to a door. You don't have to do the procedural. I happen to like the procedural, but not everybody does. I think that, and this is what I would love to know, many people fall kind of to one way or the other, but I think a lot of us are somewhere in the middle. We love the narrative. We love the story that gets created at the table. We love the stuff going on. We want to flesh out our NPCs and we want to have interesting trinkets and treasure in the dungeon. But we also like the idea of, here's the process. We're looking for traps. We're doing this because that's very old school dungeon crawling if you fall into that category like I do. As I said, I would love to know what you think. I'll put links in the description below to the things I've mentioned here. Also, you'll find a link to my Discord server. If you're not over there, please do join up and join the conversation. I did make a room for Dungeon 23, so people are going to start messing with that a little bit. Check out my blog, too. I'm going to kind of do that there. And I guess I mentioned it. And if you don't know, I have a podcast. Check out those podcast episodes. Be sure to like the video, ring the bell, do all the things that makes YouTube love to send people to this channel. And I would really appreciate it. Also, if you want to support the channel, you can join my Patreon. There's a link to that also in the show notes. I'll talk to you soon.